Hi, I'm Josh. And I'm Lindsay. And this is the Hideaway Circus Podcast, episode 85. OT Femme, that's Norwegian. Hey everybody, come at you from uh, July 2020, July 7th. Still no sign of baby Avatar. No, he's still he's still just chilling in my stomach. Three days past his due date, seven days until his formal eviction. Yeah, but I mean, it's like, come out. You have to come out. Yeah, well, given 2020, I think it's understandable why maybe he doesn't want to come out yet. Yeah, he's like, screw 2020. I'm going to just stay in here till 2021. Well, the bad news, you know, seems to be just piling on nearly every week. This past week, we learned that Circus Warehouse, which is probably the largest training facility in New York City for circus, uh, is giving up their space. I assume it's to do with, uh, you know, COVID-19 related reasons and an inability to pay rent because nobody can go train there. But it's quite a blow to the, to the local circus community here. Susie Winson, who started it and ran it and is a past podcast guest, wrote on Facebook saying it's not the end of Circus Warehouse, but it is the end of that training space. So, you know, the damage just keeps keeps piling up. Yeah, it's really sad. It does seem like every day there's a new um, business that's gone out of out of business. There's a you know a, a new business that's laying off every single employee. I mean, it's just it's endlessly sad. But I don't know how you do survive, especially as a lease of land, like a space owner, basically, um, because you have to pay rent still. And it's sad because Circus Warehouse was such a nice facility and I learned how to do flying trapeze once and only one time because I was really bad at it, but it was a really great experience. So it's definitely sad. I mean, there's not that much in the States anyway, especially in New York. So it's, uh, I hope that she can find a way to come back in a different location, if not that one. I'm sure she'll crack it. There's enough of a community around Circus Warehouse where I think, yeah, even if a space isn't there, the the group of people who train and teach and coach will we'll figure out a way to make that work in the future. Another bankruptcy I saw in the news was for a, a circus, a tented circus that mostly tours in Australia called Cirque Africa. And strangely enough, Lindsay and I had run in with Cirque Africa during our time at the Adelaide Fringe a couple of years ago because Cirque Africa is the best selling show at the Adelaide Fringe. It's a tented circus that features entirely uh, circus performers from the African continent all over, but I think mostly Ethiopia. And the company went bankrupt back in January. But what's extra strange and interesting about this story, you know, when I'm searching different circus bankruptcies, is now a number of their employees are suing the founder, at least in court, for essentially slave labor, which is the, the story oddly echoes one that Salam told on his episode where the performers are not getting paid or they're getting paid super late or a fraction of the payment and not only forced to do the show when they're not being paid, but they also have to be tent crew, taking the tent up, taking it down, doing things that you probably wouldn't typically expect a performer to have to, to, have to do. And... Just to add to the shade of the story, the circus owner, in order to get these performers to to comply with not being paid, would threaten to call their families and tell them they'd been sleeping with prostitutes and have different sort of forms of blackmail to keep these performers from really reporting them. And so this company, I guess, goes bankrupt after a couple of years of losses in January and it, during that during that process, they essentially kept the tent and everything, started a new company, and Cirque Africa is still going under a new entity. But it also seems like in that process, they did something illegal in Australia in moving all of the assets of a bankrupt Cirque Africa to a new uh, business LLC, essentially. Yeah, that seems so shady. It's like, I, how, you still have to somehow be kept like accountable for all your debt from the bankruptcy so you can't just be like oh well we filed bankruptcy so we're not gonna pay any of that and then just start a new Cirque Africa I mean we met them when we were there and it just was so strange I was like I can't believe this is the best-selling show in Adelaide and just to the point for fringe festivals you can have the best-selling show and still go bankrupt yeah I mean it's just I mean fringe festivals are a whole yeah I think crock 
pot of crap. But um, that's also something we've talked about before. I mean, it's just, but the more horrifying thing is just how they treat their performers and the fact that they could still... That's what blows my mind when I hear stories from performers about how companies treat them, not just Cirque Africa, but a few other companies that our, our friends have worked for with late payments or not paying for months on end or just like promises of something and then never coming. I just don't understand how people keep keep working for them. But I guess the job supply is so low and now it's going to be even lower with all these you know, closing of companies that you can't really be picky and choosy pick picky and choosy what sure picky and choosy choosy or picky i don't know pick pick picky you can't picky. be at least picky <laughs> you can't be picky um you know but it just blows my mind that people can like just put up with this stuff and and continue to work for people who and treat continue them to terribly. get away with it the people who are you know doing bad things getting away yeah. with it for years uh, so Google, if you're interested in that that story in the Cirque uh, Cirque Academics Cirque Academics Facebook group, uh, there's somebody who posted much more detail to to it, which we won't go into all of it. But there's a lot of allegations that I think are quite interesting. Speaking of bankruptcy, quick update on Cirque du Soleil. Seems like Daniel Lamar is going to get ousted. CEO of Cirque du Soleil, previous podcast guest. I do not think the creditors are very happy with him. <laughs> no, it doesn't seem that way. I mean, it's just so crazy. I, I, you know, we watched his little speech that he did to all of the employees of Cirque. Um, when he let them go the second time. When he let them go the second time. Um, and basically saying that all the touring, like kind of we thought would happen, actually. All the touring shows are closed and the people in Vegas and in Orlando are for now safe temporarily fired as opposed to a f permanently fired yeah um and you know there was like some emotion in the video and i felt genuine because i i think he really did not have a full grasp on the severity of the situation well i watched an interview with him on cnbc which is like a business channel in america and the way he said what was going on, he was like, when I found out we had to shut down our tours, when I learned we had to shut down Vegas, when I learned we oh had God. to lay off our employees, just the way he made it sound like he learned it as opposed <laughs> right. to like he made the decision right. goes to show maybe Daniel Lamar really wasn't making these decisions. And it was probably TPG, the majority mm -hmm. owner, who was. So basically TPG, as we said in the last episode, put in this bid, the first bankruptcy bid for for Cirque du Soleil and all of the creditors like a day later said they were rejecting it no matter what out of hand the bid was unacceptable that it was you know pennies on the dollar and only helped the people who were uh who ran it into the ground and part of that story is that those same creditors think Daniel Lamar has been siding with TPG this whole time and has been leading is part of the problem of leading this company down the you know financial drain well it does seem like that especially when they did that kind of shady thing where they tried to put all the ip for the shows into a new company and taking it out of the bankruptcy essentially kind of what Cirque africa is doing um and it's like also what's concerning about how he how he phrases i learned i learned as the leader of a company you should be able to see what's going on and be anticipating what's coming. Yeah, deciding things, not being like, oh, I learned that we had to close. That would be like a passive investor or, you know, like, I learned this. I mean, it's funny when we interviewed him, it was very hard to get what felt like genuine answers out of him. Yes, they were very like robotic press kind of answers yeah which i get you know it's a, a huge company you don't want to say anything that's uh you know re too revealing and and you have limitations on what you can and cannot say however but he did say how much he liked working with tpg right but what's interesting is that you've you've run this company for a while now and to not even have the ability to intellectually talk about it in a way that's further than just a statement answer was interesting and for those who just 
you know, reposted a lot of these stories. Just for clarification, TPG put this bid in and said they would give $20 million of that to artists and contractors. That's not money Sirk has. That was just part of their offer, which probably will get rejected. So let's just, for people who are not totally following the detail, still Cirque still owes millions of dollars to their employees and their independent contractors. And there's been no agreement yet still from the government. The government has not given them $200 million. If that happens, that will only happen after the bankruptcy proceedings. We'll get some kind of update in three days from now on July 10th, and then they get another update in about 30 days of, of what happens to this company. But I wouldn't be holding our breaths. I did see that uh, Drawn to Life, the show in Florida that is replacing Lanuba, has new dates on sale now, I think for November, uh, and that Joya, the show in Mexico, has reopened or is reopening, and the show in China is reopening. What's confusing to me about those scenarios, particularly Joya in Mexico and uh, the X show in China, is if Cirque owns those shows or if Cirque created those shows and somebody else owns those shows and that those owners are restarting them or those operators yeah. are restarting them. So it's very easy for Cirque and Daniel Lamar to make things look one way when in fact they are Not. are the other. And remember, any statement that comes out of Cirque is trying to make Cirque look valuable and like it's still got a chance so that people will put money into it and save it. And they're not going to be so honest where they really talk about the issues publicly. Right. It'll be interesting. I mean, we I think we even said this. Um, who can run Cirque? You know, like who is actually able, willing and qualified to to do it? It's not very many people. And it's a mammoth of a thing to take on, especially in such debt. And I mean, in other businesses, there are people who this is like their job, like they come in to businesses that this has gone through and and basically fix them. They're the fixers. I don't know if that exists in, in a world like this because it's so specific with circuit. I mean, arts in itself is such a different world than like a tech company or just a, a for profit business. Um, it's just such specially learned knowledge and skill. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think one just other factor to remember is what are governments going to do to support the arts in the meantime? A lot of other types of businesses are ramping back up to 100% by the end of the summer. I know this from my neighbors. I know this from my families, my friends who work in different businesses, like many of them are getting back to the office essentially, or, you know, now you're starting to have people eating outdoors in restaurants, still no sign of recovery really, really for the arts sector. Britain announced yesterday that they're going to do a $2 billion aid package to the arts. The specifics of that haven't, weren't laid out. So maybe we'll cover that in a future episode, but clearly that's I think a, some of the specifics were laid out like, um, a bit to, and they're, they're helping Wales and also Scotland. And like, there is a little bit of detail, but not too, too much. But it does seem like it's mostly going to big institutions that already exist, like the national or yeah. the Barbican or, um, cause it the, includes like museums. museums. Yeah. So, you know, we see the UK taking some steps. We'll see what Canada does. We'll see what America does. I'm not so hopeful America will do anything. I think from a practical perspective, the best thing that could happen would be an extended, um, pandemic unemployment insurance so that at least the artists who are here can continue to stay here and just yeah. live off of that bare minimum. But as soon as that goes away, people are going to have to find other kinds of work. Yeah, it's it's um, alarming. I mean, if we can't open until after January, it's just so many months of, of so many people not working. And, you know, I posted something on my own Instagram that was it's like, you know, the artists obviously are, are struggling, but it's, it's the ushers, it's the ticket takers, it's the set designers, it's the people who literally build the set, it's the prop people, it's the costume wardrobe. It's I the mean, lighting rental company. It's the lighting rental company. I mean, it's, it go, it's the press team, it's marketing, it's the digital designers, it's the merch designers, it's the concessions. I mean, it's the list goes on. It's the cleaning crews for all these theaters. Yeah, it's like when you watch a movie and you see that list of a thousand people who made it, the exact same kind of list for yeah. every show period really backstage crew i mean it just goes it's and all these people don't have a job so while the artists are the most visible they're also just one of 200 aspects of this ecosystem that exists to make theater 
work. But one other, you know, just like kind of sad um, piece of theater news was this this uh, this performer, Nick Cordero, who's been on Broadway. He's kind of like a staple in the theater scene, passed away yesterday or the day before from COVID-19. He was 41 years old and was in the ICU for 95 days. And his wife, Amanda Klutz, who is an amazing person, uh, they met on a show called Bullets Over Broadway, which was on Broadway, and um, kind of had this, you know, like magical love story. And they had a kid and and he got COVID in, um, when they were in L.A. No pre-existing conditions. No pre-existing conditions. 41 years old, a performer, fit. And and was in the ICU for 95 days and died. So wear a mask, people. Just wear a mask. Wear a mask. But let's get back to business. And, you know, our guest today, Captain Frodo, who is a legendary showman, a.k.a. the incredible rubber man who has worked on The Clique, La Soiree, for Spiegel World, many other shows, uh, talks extensively about... What does it mean for a performer to be a performer in the time of coronavirus when there are no shows? How can you be a showman when there is no show? And how do you find meaning in that time? And I think people suffering with that question, us artists who would, who usually have an audience who, who don't have one and we don't know when we're going to get one back, I think Frodo really has found not only a way to express himself, but also to articulate these the challenges feeling, yeah. in a really beautiful and, and intellectually thoughtful way. Yeah, I mean, he was great to talk to. It's going to be a fun podcast for you to listen to. You know, he has like some really fun little stories of being a magician's assistant with his father and kind of coming into his own through that, which was interesting to to learn about. So I think you'll enjoy this podcast. Hopefully it'll bring a little bit of positivity to your life. But before we let you listen to the episode, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Circus Talk, the online circus community's number one place to find jobs, news, resources. You can even do your own ticketing for an online show if you put what on through their new PayPal system. I use Circus Talk really pretty religiously to check what's going on in the circus community. If you're a fan of our podcast, you'll probably be a fan of theirs. And if you like our podcast, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, tweet us, or email us at hello at hideawaycircus.com. Here is our interview with Captain Frodo. Frodo, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're definitely one of our most requested guests, and I feel like I have been admiring your your showman stories and showmanship since I first saw you in the clique, I think in like 2007 with Brett Pfister. But I'm super pumped to have you on the podcast today. I'm wondering if we can start off by learning about where you're from originally. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on a podcast. And it's very uh, flattering to hear that I've been uh, requested as well. Um, yeah, um, I am Captain Frodo. Travel the world as the incredible rubber man for my most of my adult life. Oh, and my child life. So I, I uh, back in uh, I I was born in Norway, and my father is a magician. So I uh, spent my childhood traveling with him. I mean, we we lived in one place, but we went uh, traveling. We we toured quite a lot as a as a duo. He just said he just said he recently found some uh, paperwork of where he'd written it down and. He said we'd done 125 shows in one of the years when I was about 12 years old. So that means that even at that point, we were doing sort of shows every third day throughout the year. I mean, it was centered around holidays and whatever. So that's how I got into the business. Was your father like very straight edge the way some magicians can be where they don't drink and don't do drugs in order to like not reveal secrets and are quite... Uh, closed Cagey. people, caged people, or was he a different kind of guy? Uh, different kind of guy. He's <laughs> a very, very friendly, very jovial kind of guy, but he would certainly not uh, reveal any secrets. And uh, in the very beginning, too, I think, I think there was a little uh, tricks that he was using on me to get me. So, for instance, he would say, uh, first it was like I weren't allowed to be in the show, weren't allowed to just be his assistant and hand him props. I needed to have an act myself too, even if it was terrible when I when I did it. Just the fact, you know, dressing me up in the same outfit as him, so both in tuxedos and 
uh, and uh, and then me doing some sort of tricks. So that was kind of one way of sort of forcing me to rehearse because I had much more desire to be in the show than to actually create any content for it. And it was like, wanted to be like dad. So I just wanted to be on stage. And this is a moment when you're standing there as a 10-year-old looking at them and going, man, I wish I had something I could show them. <laughs> and when I'm already on stage. So he would not reveal secrets to other people. Uh, uh, that was that was like a core thing. And for me as well, he was tricking me into getting into magic and getting into reading, where he's just saying, like, I won't teach you how this trick is done, but here is the book that says how it's done, or here is the instructions that comes with the trick, and you have to read them yourself. And just that, to read like a technical how to use a finger guillotine is one of the things that springs to mind. There's a certain thing you have to do with it to make it possible to use the guillotine and it chops through your finger. I remember sitting on the couch and really struggling, like reading stuff that was ahead of my years, but wanting to know how this magical apparatus worked. So that was like a little way to push into it. And of course, that was the same with English because there's much more literature about magic in English. Norway only has four million, four and a half million people. So that's like smaller than New York. And if they had their own language and only the magicians who published in New Yorkian language, that would be the only books that you had. So it's a very niche market in Norway. So I was early on pushed into reading and talking English. What was the first act that you did on stage with your dad? It was a torn and restored uh, paper kind of cool. thing. Yeah, it was like... Uh, yeah, you know, like a newspaper kind of thing. And I, 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 one of the things that has also changed since then is that um, now there is video footage and recordings and pictures are just everywhere. There exists not one second of footage of me and my father performing together when I was a child and almost no pictures because all the pictures that were taken so he performed maybe from 86 to maybe in 96, but by the last few years, I was doing more and more on my own. It was all people at the Christmas mm. tree party or whatever where we were. They're taking a picture, then they go home and they develop it, and it's in the thing. So even when I was in the paper in my hometown a while ago, I tried to make a call out in an interview to say, uh, if anyone has any any footage or anything of us, but nothing came of it, or any, even any paper pictures of just me on stage with my dad, because it must exist in someone's old photo album. But anyway, I'm getting off track. No, that's great. What, was there a moment, though, where you thought, like, maybe magic isn't for me, but this other type of genre, this variety comedy skills genre, is, is more my natural bent? Or did your dad push you in that direction? How did that sort of develop? I've had the knack for the allied arts, as they're called, uh, like the arts that are allied to magic. So particularly juggling. I got interested in juggling early on. And part of it was because I found it challenging that every time when I presented something, there was a secret. And the kind of magic that I was doing in the beginning with my dad, before I sort of started doing more cards and coins, which is a little bit more you can show your friends and then give them the deck of cards. A lot of the things that we had used magical apparatus. So particularly when I got a little bit older, I became a punk and you couldn't have a spangled box and show now it's empty, here are some silk handkerchief. <laughs> but they basically go, well, we, we know it's the box that does it. And that gave me this sort of, as a lot of my friends at that time, they were just playing in bands or doing other things, which is what I sort of also drifted towards. And, having that uh, punk or rock and roll ethos was in some ways perhaps what led me towards, um, towards freak show stuff. And I, cause I was interested and I had books on the subject, but all of them were historical and it was in 1992 or 93. I, I saw the Jim Rose uh, circus came to, uh, to Denmark and that made me, because I had one other friend who did kind of fakir stuff, you know, with pins and needles and stuff. And so I was tuned towards it. And then that same summer, I saw um, Jim Rose with Enigma and Torture King and Matt Tube Crowley. Like, it's an extraordinary lineup. And it just made me go, holy moly, this is, people can actually do these kind of acts. And that was what set me in uh, in that freak show direction. Because before I became a vaudeville or cabaret kind of performer, I spent a good uh, 
six, seven years and only really performed in freak shows and side shows. Was the incredible rubber man part of the freak show graduation from magic with your dad? Yeah, it was. There's a, there's a, like with everything, it's a, it's a bleeding, uh, it's like a crossfade. I did a straitjacket escape in my dad's show. And, uh, you know, my dad put a straitjacket on me and wrapped me up in chains. And, and uh, I mean, that's a funny in itself, just having an adult, <laughs> uh, a dad uh, calling a human restraint company to ask for a children's size straitjackets. <laughs> they had courses I browsed to be raised. But anyway, he, we had the straitjacket and he wrapped it around me. And then we started doing this thing because I have always been able to do these uh, 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 body uh dislocations and uh, contortions but when you grow up with the a body you are just used to this is the natural range of movement so it was only really when I could compare myself to other people that I could tell that I was uh, different than the others in how I could move so we started to do this tiny little bit where before the straight jacket my dad would sort of show say oh and he can do these crazy things and this is why he can go out of the straight jacket and in a way then from that we realized that people were almost more interested in those things than they were in the straight jacket <laughs> uh, it still took a bunch of years before i fully separated those two out and did an act that was just based on contortion but it's, it felt like it, i needed to sort of start to trust it because those things that came to me naturally they they didn't feel as exceptional as how incredibly hard i worked to learn how to juggle five balls for instance solidly so you could present it as a material so that was so difficult so the challenge of that made me think that that was better material but in hindsight uh, it turns out juggling is not quite as exciting as what <laughs> you think when you're doing it yourself unless you have like your head over or your leg over your head and you're juggling <laughs> then you yeah, can combine yeah. both but was yeah. there a moment in this journey maybe it was during the shy to the sideshow days or with your dad where comedy and storytelling and the importance of that integrated with technique that started to to develop in your your style yeah comedy has has always been part of my uh my persona i from when i was a kid as well because doing magic you you're presenting an illusion so you you say you do one thing and you are actually doing something else so there's a really strong storytelling element in every piece of good magic because you have to tell a very good story that is incredibly cohesive so that and this is the effect and meanwhile the method is going on underneath so you go here i have an empty hand and it's not empty but you need to believe it then you need to go and here, here is a coin or whatever so the story, so there is a storytelling aspect in there, but being very young and doing a show and of course wanting to have the style of uh, David Copperfield or Channing Pollock or whatever and, and do magic. For every, mag, sometimes magic doesn't happen and it's just <laughs> a guy that goes, here I have an empty hand, clink, wow. And then you need to sort of deal with it. So just the <laughs> fact that I've been in that situation and then getting the response from the audience for that. If you manage to take that in your stride, th then they love you even more. And I think that was the, like the drive. And it also started this feedback mechanism that I quite early on clicked onto of being in with listening to the audience. And if you can go where they want you to go, they will love you more for it so you come out with your pre-prepared material but always be ready to listen and to extend or modify next time you go on based on the response you got last time so so yeah that's kind of story that might be the origin or embryo of thinking of story for how to present your skills it's also so interesting just hearing you recount your your childhood your relationship with the audience it's such a you've had such a long relationship with an audience in a way yeah. Um, yeah, and particularly true. a real audience as opposed to say like a high school musical where you're performing for your parents and your friends parents yeah. people who hey, are they are judgy too sure they're judgy it's just a different audience <laughs> yeah um, it's true that's right but i'm like i've also been thinking about that lately it's when i then finished school i pretty much straight away i met there was a girl that moved to my hometown and uh, she uh through and she knew a friend of mine and she started at the school that I went to, a little Waldorf school. And my friend said, like, oh, this is Eve. She is uh, from Oslo. And uh, and she was like, yeah, I, I hear that you know how to juggle. 
she had just started getting into circus with this whole gang of uh, of uh, punks, basically the punks and hippies and whatever that were doing juggling and the circus skills. So, and that summer, I then when in summer holiday, we went to Oslo and I met all of these people. And for the part, partly when somebody came over to me and said, "You, you know how to juggle," because I didn't know anyone else that was interested in this. There was no one else. There was a small juggling group that I had started, but nothing that went directly driven by me in that town so it was very surprising that somebody came and was interested and when i then arrived on the scene in in oslo the capital city it's a metropolitan giant city with five hundred thousand people in it and uh, it was a uh, it was i came on the scene like red fully made i could juggle and more than that i had because I was mainly interested in circus, but it turned out that it's like I didn't want to do jug- um, magic in the shows that I did together with them. But I am, um, but they, I was certainly well, well above mm-hmm. kind of everyone else on on having a stage presence. So I came into that, and and that really sort of set the. So in in a way, I have the audience and my rapport with the audience to thank for my entire career, which is so intrinsically interwoven with my life that it's they are. That, which is why it's so devastating now that I've lost them. I don't know. I've completely run They're there. Now. They're on the internet listening now, but <laughs> they'll come back in person eventually. <laughs> One thing I was just thinking about, though, was just like the difference of magic, which I actually haven't really ever thought about, of like a presentational magician versus like a, a magician who feels much more connected with the audience, like a Piff the Magic Dragon versus like a David Copperfield. Yeah. And like a David Copperfield, if he messes up, it's such a huge show. Do we not even notice? Does he not even like acknowledge it? Do we just move on? Like, I don't yeah. know. But often, I guess, I mean, not to cut you off, Rhoda, but often I think with great magicians, it's like the ability to pivot in the moment. Mm. It's those ones who are like, oh, crap, that didn't work. And don't say anything. And then yeah. take it, you know, to the left or wherever to, to bail themselves out <laughs> of it. But uh, answer that. But and additionally on that, I'm wondering if you can... The magicians who I do know all have like large collections of like books, sort of like you're saying with magic and these secrets and how to do them. And I think most people who are listening, at least the Americans, will be most familiar with your tennis racket act and your can stacking act. I don't know if that's yeah. like what you call it, but that's what it sort of looks like. And are those things you found in books or things you saw somebody else do? How did those allied disciplines come into your world? So uh, once, uh, so in uh, 1998, I was uh, performing a kind of handcuff contortion escape act on the street with, where I juggled with the handcuffs on and ate an apple while I was juggling fire with an apple. And I did, and, but I did a contortion act as part of that. And, uh, and at that point, I was like any young kind of uh, performer. I, I did everything like on my, if, when you got my business card, it was just like an essay of basically everything, whip cracking, knife throwing, sword swallowing, <laughs> juggling, magic, uh, comedy. Like it was just, you know, it's just a list of, and you'd write that to compensate for the fact that you're not particularly good at any of them. So you have to put quantity as opposed to quality. Anyway, there was this guy, the John Kamikaze, who ran the Kamikaze Freak Show, a Scottish-based freak show who saw me in the audience. And then after they had another tour planned later on that year. And they saw me in the street show and came up to me and said, hey, would you like to be the rubber man in my freak show? And uh, that was really when I, after that, that I, and I said yes. And uh, did that for three, four, three years, three and a half years. Uh, and to, toured together with him and, and a whole gang of people. And it was a, uh, it was during that time that I then became went from being just Captain Frodo to be Captain Frodo the Incredible Rubber Man. And so that made me frame my act specifically towards um, the contortion. And uh, it was him actually who very first said because I was doing a uh, contortion where I squeezed through a, 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 a coat hanger you know, a wire coat hanger, and he said you should go through a tennis racket. So, I was, so it was actually him that kind of got me onto the first one. Then I bought the second tennis racket that was a little bit too large. Realized later on um, that I could put my leg through it. Then even later on, realized I could do both at the same time, which is also a complicated thing. 
Then I worked on another act where I'd played the musical Saw and did a kind of George Carl uh, slapstick thing whilst playing the musical Saw and sawing one of my fingers off and whatever. But that act just bombed from the start and never worked. <laughs> All tour of that act and it never, like, then it took another extra 15 minutes or so before I won them back. That was a kind of a longer <laughs> show. But uh, so, and then at um, in another tour, I then, some situation arose whilst doing the rackets where I then went into a little bit of the shtick from the microphone stuff that I had rehearsed for something else. And it just gelled together like it was meant to be. And immediately the audience grabbed onto it from the very, very first time that I did it. It, uh, because whenever you're doing physical comedy and you're doing, um, slapstick like that, you fall over or whatever, you need to really make the audience believe that you are actually in, um, in trouble or that you're actually having trouble standing up. And when you're just standing on your both legs, it's very difficult to sell your clumsiness to the audience, especially if you're also doing very physically skilled <laughs> tricks as well. So then, so it was through that. And once I'm standing on one leg with my leg through the racket, which I then turns out it's one of my most invisible and least lauded skills is that I am ridiculously good at standing on one leg and look like I don't know what I'm doing. So I have one very strong leg and one floppy elastic one. It's very interesting. I would never have thought this, but it's so clearly influenced by magic technique that you just brought up of, you know, presenting yeah. the story being one thing while you're actually, you know, doing the other. And I mean, I learned it. I think I've seen probably your, both those acts, at least five or six times in person and so I put a bunch more on video for sure. But I mean, that is the way the racket act is built. It's all these like very, Absolutely. very subtle setups that you don't notice that you've moved the microphone from your <laughs> left hand to your right hand so that a moment mm -hmm. later it can be tangled in such a way or. Yeah, that's right. It's like the first time when you see the act, you see the art of the act, what I have created it for. It's the surface appearance of it. And it's very funny and all chaotic. Yet when you, if you just think about it a little bit going, it's amazing. It, the, is someone here fasting up or slow or speeding up or slowing down the music? Because it keeps hitting these points because there's like five different tracks and it ends just as the fanfare comes on, on the music. And you don't notice it the first time, but then when you see it the second time, some people see it and get disappointed because mm -hmm. it's like they just got to see, oh, it, it wasn't what I thought it was. And But what you're actually starting to see the second and the third time when you see it is that you see the craft that goes into creating the chaos. Like you see all the subtle details that, that I have to do because of how I have whatever the moment uh, uh, demands to sell it as 100% real. So you first you see the art and then you discover the craft uh, behind it or the artifice is sort of what's on the on the top of it was there ever a moment i only have one other friend who did who does a racket act who's been a past guest who's mostly a juggler and at some point when he was like 17 or 18 he was like i want to stop doing the racket act like there's not enough skill in it and he hadn't developed it to the way you had where it's a whole act it's just like i'm gonna go through it in about 90 seconds two minutes and look what i did but did you ever have, have you ever struggled with questioning the weirdness of, of, uh, the, the skills that you've chosen and developed in, cause they, there aren't, it's not so, um, these aren't classical skills you learn in circus school. No. And that's why I think I mostly, although it's a uh, very non-traditional, I guess, but I mostly identify with the clown. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I put even on my, on my, uh, when I finally calmed down with listing how many things I knew how to do on my business card, <laughs> I called myself a sideshow clown. So a sideshow clown and a physical comedian contortionist. So it's like that's that nailing it down to three things. So that like I was, I was already there. I was focusing on that as opposed to classical skills. So my main thing was that I really wanted to be funny and, connect to the audience through laughter. Well, I think you clearly succeed, obviously, at the comedy element. That's It's uh, truly hysterical when you watch it. But 
Were there references of people who you saw in old time movies or old clowns or where were you pulling the physical comedy inspiration from? George Carl. I saw George Carl and loved George Carl's act. There's a direct sort of link between me and and him, who is the king of uh, microphone slapstick, even though my style sort of is, is quite different. But I also, I mean, I because I was doing physical comedy, and a reference for that is, of course, Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. So I watched those movies and loved the fact that, that they existed and everything, but I, I, I didn't... Uh, I, I didn't quite know what to take from it, but I tr- truly sort of loved it. And I, I know that it's it's um, in many ways. Although I loved Buster Keaton the most because he was the most physically funny guy, I think the inspiration that I drew from Chaplin in in the incredible pathos that he can deliver that really inspired me of being able to be really silly and really funny, but then also deliver these really strong emotional punches. And he did that. And, uh, and that was certainly something that I, uh, that I deliberately pursued. Because once you've been funny enough, you go, it's like, oh, I want to express something a little bit more meaningful than that I can squeeze through two rackets. Sure. I mean, I've heard a lot of playwrights, and I actually heard Franco Dragon say this on a podcast as well, that people tend to create the same show over and over and over again in their in a different different way. Is there like a core theme or a core something to the core that you feel ties you know most of your acts together and what it's delivering from that sort of pathos storytelling kind of perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, in many ways, it's what I say when I'm sitting on those cans. I this the message that I'm selling to the people. I am the exemplification that this is possible. That it doesn't matter how weird it is, the thing that you that gives you pleasure or that is meaningful or so to you. Because look at what I do. Because really, when you look at what I do, it is so idiotic and ridiculous. Yet you just sat there and laughed your heart out and had a great time. So, and on that, once, you know, when I'm sitting on the cans, I'm, I've won them over by showing how completely physically inept I am with my tennis racket act, where it looks like I can hardly even stand upright. And then by the time they see me, when there's in a last for reference, and so it's actually in opium as well now, the can balance. Uh, when I'm stick stacking, start stacking those on top of each other and climb on top, it is doubly seems like twice as bad an idea because you've just seen me. I didn't even manage to stand on the stage properly. I fell off the stage and so you go, this is such a bad idea. So and that, that heightens that moment. And also they, they're, they're, the audience's defenses are down because I am uh, I'm just a funny guy. I didn't say anything that they needed to protect themselves for. So they just got their hearts open and are laughing. And, and then when I sit down on the top and I... I go, isn't it amazing what people do for a living? People laugh wholeheartedly. And when I then say, now I want you to think about something that you wanted to do with your life, but that you never always thought was too weird or crazy to pursue. Well, it's now that you've seen what I do. Maybe that dream of yours doesn't seem so strange anymore. So follow your dreams. And yeah. wrapped in that package, that seems like the most profound thing, even though... It is a Hallmark card, but a cliche is like something which has been so, is so important and so meaningful that it has in a, in a sense kind of fossilized, but by, by everything that led up to that moment, when I say it, it speaks truth. It speaks truth directly to them and their hearts are open and not protecting themselves. And then it's important. So I guess it's this sort of, motivational kind of thing you can do whatever you want that's certainly one of the themes and the other theme is you have it a lot in in movies and in the literature and whatever about circus it's that circus performers or the when the carnival comes to town there is a kind of secret knowledge that is hidden within here they know something because in many in many ways i i have this thesis that uh, that i think it's the carnival's 
and the craft of the showman, the fortune telling and the freaks and all the mystery and mind reading, all these th- the evidence for that, that people have seen around the world that they can count as this is why I believe in the supernatural, that was all provided by us. So they believe in it because they go like up and going, my father-in-law, the the psychiatrist, who who then mentioned to me something about spoon bending and as if it was, but this, you know, this is real. I'm going, it's, uh, I have several friends who make a living from doing exactly those tricks. And and these are the books and DVDs that is on how to do that. And isn't it then weird? Because you would never believe it if I said, oh, I saw this miracle worker. He had this girl in a spangly dress. He put her in a spangly box and sawed her in two pieces, took it apart, no blood, nothing. Then he put her back together again. It was a miracle. You would think that is a magician. And the only reason you don't describe what you just told me as a magician is because you don't know that this is what magicians do. So, um, being slightly beside the point, people do think, and in a, in a way that is what the way of the showman is about, it is, there is a kind of secret knowledge in there and they're all in the symbolics and the, the metaphors of the circus. We can find a lot of truth. So those are the kind of two things that have been going to, in the beginning, it was just the folly of dreams and now in the shows when I do do solo shows, it's been this, I want to make you feel like there's something more going on. You are still going to laugh at me, but, but, but it's a clown that is d- delivering his magic and everything. Like there is something unbelievable about this. Even if I'm just dealing with feather flowers and a spangly box. You've made me think of so many things in that answer Two two things I want to pull out of it. One. So in your podcast that we'll talk about, you talk a bunch about poetry in the episode that you released today, the day we're recording this. And there's this, I've been reading this book of poems by a guy named Robert Lax, who toured with the circus when he was in his late twenties, um, in the U S and he has this beautiful poem, which summarizes it's pre contemporary circus circus has to tell a story or serve some other purpose that the true purpose of circus is to prove that it can be done. That is the core fundamental purpose of it. So I think there's something interesting in how that mirrors sort of the phrase you said. And then the other, going back to the second, this sort of secret knowledge, and you wouldn't know it unless you describe it as magic and then all of a sudden it's revealed as such, is um, Darren Brown. I don't know if you know that English magician. Very, very well, yeah. So, okay, so you probably know this reference, but he has a recent stand-up special where he's experimenting with um, faith healing, where he tells mm-hmm. the audience, I'm going to do, I'm going to faith heal you the way a preacher would come into a town and heal people magically. I'm going to tell you it's not real beforehand, but I'm still going to do everything and show that it totally, it works. Um, and I think there's something, the exactly what you're saying, the secrecy, what happens behind the curtain is... As much as that story, that magic story, it all is tied together in such an interesting way. But going back to the what's actually happening versus the story you're you're telling, they're all they're all interestingly. It's even linked. like even uh you know something as traditional as the Wheel of Death act with the like fake jump rope trip, you know, and it, it gets the audience so like hyped and like oh my god, it's just so dangerous. And I when I first saw that act, I was like oh my god, I can't believe he messed up. And Josh like that's a, that's built in. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god, but- it's true. But you put those things in, and it's like it's, and then, and uh, although that bit is like it, the, the, there are certain demands that the material is making mm-hmm. uh, on how to present it, and the near death is uh, is one of them. Like that, you do this jump rope, and you almost fall off, or whatever. And but then, the, then the reality is, is that that is just to remind the audience in a way that this is an act that, yeah, I, as a friend of mine, worked in China and someone fell down from one of those. She was a single mom and the kid was in the dressing room and she couldn't go, and they were then looking after the, like, this, as much as it's like, a, a, like, we, you get used to it and you do, and it's the fake fall. It's like, it, but the risk is so real. unbelievably real mm-hmm. and the movement of the thing, it's like, there was a hair's breadth of it, and that is what that moment reminds you of, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, the danger the of Wheel of Death, 
obviously that's not exactly the topic we're talking about is is so real <laughs> one of our first guests salama wabi who was a circus coach of mine who um He's from Morocco originally, and he's the kind of coach who can teach you technique, but what he's really teaching you is culture and attitude and how to practice and how to think as opposed to just these are the tricks you need to learn. But he did Wheel of Death when he was a teenager, and the day after Christmas, they did the trick with the jump rope. They do backflips on the outside. Him and his partner had, you know, had a drink for Christmas on Boxing Day. His partner was hungover, fell off, and died, you know, and he never did Wheel of Death yeah. again. But, you know, it's it is that sort of casual attitude with risk that is is what is so amazing about. Um, but it's like the poem. It's like a circus is showing that it can be done. I yeah. love that. I uh, that is that I'll is send you I'll send you the link to the to the book. It's really worth reading. Um, Please do. I was taking notes when you were doing that. Yeah. For Let's those see. listening, it's Robert Lax is the poet. The book is called Circus Days and Nights, and it's a summary of a bunch of poems. Um, and fun fact about it, the first famous poem he had in it was called Circus of the Sun, written in 1950, <laughs> which makes me think like, wow, that phrase Circus of the Sun has been bouncing around the ether for many years before like Cirque coined it in French. Yeah. Um, oh, du soleil. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question yeah. about audiences, I guess, because I was thinking about how you've performed for like very niche audiences in the sense of like a ma people seeing magic and then people seeing like a freak show and then people also choosing to go see a variety show and mm. how maybe different they are or similar um because obviously like you know a broadway audience is so different from a circus audience and then a variety show audience is even different than like a big apple circus audience or a cirque du soleil show audience and, and maybe if you could add on to that the difference between those people in vegas and those people in you know, Europe or Australia. Yeah, I mean, the, each different place has their own way of uh, reacting to, like, to the whole show. Because we I did 12 years of touring with Las Ray before the last uh, few years, two, three years with uh, with Spiegel World. And there's a link between Las Ray and all the clique and Spiegel World as well when we did that. 2006 uh, first season under the name of Absinthe. So I was in the inaugural season of Absinthe as well. In, in New, New York? York City. In New York, yeah, at the uh, Fulton Street Fish Market. Yeah. 17. Uh, so each different place and each different show has its own reactions to the acts. And that, that when I, the first times when I do the show, do a show in a new city or in a new country, you are, I am relying on the muscle memory and knowing that my material is funny. It's like a hard corporate gig when they are, they're there not to see you and you come out and you do it and you go, I'm glad I know this comedic timing because I can't read you guys. Mm. So, but as I, that, therefore I feel like is it often on the, on the premiere, it's not the best show if that is the first show. Because I then become attuned to the local differences through doing the act and I then, make these subtle changes in the act to tune it up. But I, and, but here, and then because Las Vegas, that too, it's a, uh, there, there is a, there is a certain style that they, that they like here. That is, um, that they find more funny. And I am, I, I'm, you know, people like it to be a little bit more crass in the show. I swear more when I'm here, the, the physical comedy is kind of the same, but, uh, uh, there's certainly always uh, slightly different uh, things, and some of that also just comes out comes out in in a kind of character way, the way that my character or the way that the character's attitude becomes as well. Sometimes I'm very, very positive and very happy and very excited. If it's uh, uh, whilst well, whilst when we're doing these late night shows here in Las Vegas, I'm a little bit more kind of like uh, like. All you know, at least that that he thinks he is cool, because it's quite clear very soon that I'm not cool. But I'm, <laughs> I have a slight more, slight more attitude than what I would in a, in some other shows. Yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, I guess my biggest like thinking of like um, comparing audiences is is more specifically like the freak show audience versus just a variety audience. Like, is it more because? To me, I've, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, 
the thing about it, when, when we, when, so first I was in the Kamikaze Freak Show, and then afterwards, uh, me and the three others started a show called The Happy Side Show. And we toured for four and a half years. It was based out of Australia. And it started out with, so the name is kind of a little bit odd, but it started out as a description of what it was that we wanted to do. And it became the name of the show because we all felt very excited by, and just like you were saying about circus shows you that it is possible, freak shows shows you that it is possible and that being different is something to be celebrated. And being able to do unusual things or being able to do dangerous things is something that you should be proud of. So in so in that show, we wanted to give the audience the feeling about what we did, what the, um, wanted to, to share, the, to give them the same kind of feeling about the material as what we had, making it happy, making it something that you are excited about. Mm. So, so in a way... Because it, it's almost like the, the material of freak show. When you, if if you think on it just on level one, mm -hmm. you go, okay, this is. I'm going to put a spoon or I put a nail up my nose. So what I need to do is to go. Ah, this is crazy! Look at me! It's uh, the pain is too much to bear. But for us, it's going. That is what the trick is telling you. So if you want to have it work on more than one level, then try to make them by the time you actually do the thing that they now want to see it and that you have transformed the experience by your presentation. So that was kind of what we were doing with Sideshow mm. in, in that show. So there's definitely there's different experiences and I have always been on that side because as I mentioned before, like I kind of saw myself as a, um, as a Sideshow clown mm -hmm. and I'm using this like entertainment by unease and comedy by the uncomfortable so I'm setting up and I'm telling that I'm going to do something uncomfortable. And that's why so in the very beginning of my show, I tend this act, I say, I'm going to squeeze through these rackets and, and I make jokes about it, but I'd make it very clear very early on that I'm going to do a dislocation. And then there is like eight minutes until I actually do it. But just this promise of something where you go, I, when I, cause that's the description of my act. When I say, I'm going to do a dislocation, you go, yeah, I, I don't want to see that. But by the time that I do it, you accept it because you now like me and you now let me push your buttons into an area of uh, uncomfortability. And there's a there's that tension that comes as soon as you, you say you're going to do something that is uh, challenging to them. Tension starts to build and real good comedy is all about building up tension and releasing it. So set up, punchline, release. So I'm using the uh, uncomfortableness of situations to create comedy and i have been doing that since i started in that chemical that was in the late 90s well i love i love the like departure for the sideshow in trying to how do you re reframe what sideshow is as a as a concept uh, one thing you're just saying about the tennis racket act just makes me think of street show experience like that's mm -hmm. what you do right you you get the crowd there and you say i'm gonna do this crazy thing look at this big ladder you know but mm -hmm. you don't you don't use the ladder or do the crazy thing until until you've yeah. done everything else. And that crazy thing is really, it's just a device to get you to set up the journey yeah. of that act. But it's it's so cool hearing your, like how these things are all uh, all correlated with your, your performing experiences. One thing that you talked about in a recent blog post and in the first episode of your new podcast, The Way of the Showman, is how Vegas is this like... Uh, uh exception to the rule you can have a real life and you can you can be in shows and it's this i love how you framed it as this like uh devil's bargain that you know <laughs> then now the devil has come to collect on it in in this context of of no shows and now you're on the hook for all the things that <laughs> happens when you have a real life but yeah aside from the sort of philosophical concepts of that can you talk a little bit about that transition where at some point you must have felt like, okay, I've been touring, I've been around the world, like I want a sense of normalcy, I want to have a regular family, or if that maybe isn't how it happened and it, you came in a different direction? That is how it happened. The year before I came here, we wanted to settle down and I decided, okay, I am. So we bought a house in, uh, in a beautiful place uh, right near Byron Bay in, uh, in Australia. It's it, glorious just a few minutes from the beach and it is subtropical and it was so nice we got a nice house 
And that year I was then going to do just a shorter touring. So I did uh, corporate gigs and all that. But most of my work is in, in um, Europe. So that year I went overseas, which is a big deal when you're in Australia. That's a 35-hour journey. So 10 times in that year, oh my God. which meant that I was each month, basically, I was traveling. So I was away a lot. Uh, and I was technically working less, but I was jet lagged. So going to Europe for like a week or 10 days or sometimes three weeks, just enough to fully get into that time zone and then go back again. So I had 20 jet lags in one year. And I, all of that, and so, and, but whilst that was happening, while I was doing this gig in South Africa, actually, uh, the, I was talking to the producers of Opium because I've been on the list and been talking to the director of that show for the eight months leading up to it. And, and I was like, no, I, I just can't do it because I have this house and we are, this is what we want to do. And my daughter has gotten into this gorgeous uh, world of school in this area that's really hard to get into. And, and, and I was just a few months. And then, and then during those next sort of months, we went, this is not sustainable. I can't do this. I'm away much more than I want to. And then yeah, the, the opening of, uh, of uh, Opium had, had a sort of fraught double start. It opened up and wasn't quite ready, and then it was redone. And as they were then planning the redoing of that, they were also opening Absinthe. So originally, I came here to be an Absinthe. The first chunk of time, I was being paid by absent and performing in the other show because <laughs> as they came over they did a new revamp of the of the show so like a 2.0 kind of version of the show and I was in that and and so but it just it went kind of from a night to day and we realized then that as we had said no to the first creative process and and the opening of the show in January we still ended up being here in April uh I was there or was it yeah early April so it was just the show technically only opened in March. So it was only really like the first month and a half or a month or so that I wasn't in opium. So I've kind of been in there from the start. But during that, I wanted suburban life, wanted to be able to drop off my daughter at school and come home and and couldn't sustain it in this other place. And then I, that's where that uh, metaphor came from. It's like there was this one place, Sin City in Las Vegas, Nevada, where the, the devil just forgot. So here, the showmen don't have to like, to travel all the time. It can be with be like a normal person goes to show goes to do a show and then come back home, and uh, that was uh, where that metaphor came from. So that's how I ended up here. And this has just this is what this is. People go, it's crazy in Las Vegas. Oh man, you must have such a party vibe. And we're like, no, this is suburban life for us. We're hanging out by the pool and we got friends and school. I'm deeply involved in raising money for a little world of school there and it's like yeah so it's i'm very suburban here have you made and friends with any like suburban neighbors who are accountants or doctors or people you wouldn't have met you know in in your actual uh career yeah a little bit a little bit a little bit with the neighbors and uh and at school that's the main kind of thing talking to the other parents so yeah i find Lindsay and i's only real connection with non showbiz with the real world is through our neighbors and our family's friends. <laughs> yeah. You know, those are those are the two the two gaps where reality um yeah sneaks in somehow. But I do find that when I, you know, I, like I mentioned where like T minus eighteen days till our due date and I I find myself like contemplating a lot about how when we talk to our neighbors who do like finance and, you know, work at Facebook, um how how lucky we are to be in a field that's so diverse and different just like thinking wise and um how many people we get to be a part of um their journey and like just such a different story just like even hearing you like i don't think our neighbors know anyone who grew up doing magic shows with their dad you know and yeah. and something that i want to like definitely keep in our in our kids life is this idea of like just meeting so many different people. And I think it's so easy to like not meet different people. It is. It is. Yeah. And it's the traveling and all that, that helps that, that or that, or that dictates that as, as well. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it is open-minded and it's like, it's the circus is such a perfect 
symbol for that too. So like, I am even in by being in shows constantly, I am rarely on the running order with another contortionist. Mm. So I, apart from the little bits that you meet there, those people that you really connect to are the ones that I work with for years in the same show. And then I am re- I'm usually only the, so, so it's like you always are in a, on a bill where variety is key. Mm. So, you know, these days it's also like, it's, it's, it's the different skill. Each one needs to be very unique in their own right. When we before, before perform with the happy side show that I talked about before, I knew how to swallow swords before we went into that show. But because I was the rubber man, there was a guy in the show that was a sword swallow. And, and for that entire four and a half years, I did not one single performance of sword swallowing anywhere so that that would be a unique thing. And in the beginning, we thought, oh, we could do some double sword swallows or whatever, but we kind of thought, it's like in a band, you don't, you want to have, you don't want to have two drummers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's like double bass, you know. Even the actual double, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Do you have aspirations for your daughter to, to be a third generation performer? How is that now reflecting on your own experience with your dad, you know, affecting you as a parent? Yeah, I did a, a, a magic act together with her where she was the star in uh, in uh, when she was four, so it's three years ago. And I billed her as the girl with the million dollar nose. So it's a <laughs> mentalism act where you can tell it's like they all all the kids got to pull out a chocolate bar and then they touch it, hold it for a while. It's like a chocolate, uh, different brands. And they all put it in a bag and then she would pull it out and she would smell it and she would then smell the other kids' hands and she could tell who it was that had touched it. Uh, so it's like a, presenting the, men, the the mind reading thing as a smelling thing. And that was that. So that was the first one. She did the, her first contortion act because she has the same things going on with her joints that I do. And she is more flexible than me. My sister has it as well, and she is less flexible than me. And I always just thought that that was because I have cultivated it. But now that my daughter has has it, and she is even more flexible, I'm like, well, you know, it's it. it, it I I got to wait and see, you know, because she's got to decide what she wants to do. Maybe she doesn't want to be be a contortionist. Maybe she wants to be a magician or a or an aerial artist. I don't know. <laughs> or anything else. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, you know, recently I've been enjoying your podcast and there are, uh, as of at least today, there are two episodes out, but I imagine by the time this is out, there'll be maybe three. How did you, what was the genesis of, of why you wanted to make a podcast? And maybe you could briefly explain just what it is and slightly how it's different from a typical, say, interview podcast like ours. Yeah, it's... um the podcast is called The Way of the Showman, and it is, in a sense, me presenting my way of looking at the world. I look at the world through the lens of showmanship. I've been the showman all my life, and what, and that has colored all of my uh, interactions with the world, whether it is what I find meaningful, what, what gives purpose to my life, and and how I basically understand the world. So that's that's the sort of philosophical underpinnings of it. And also then it's the side note is that when I was at university, I studied philosophy and then applied to study comparative religion, mm-hmm. uh, but they got sidetracked by a three-month circus course in 1995 in, in Bristol in England. And then and I just said yes to one thing after the other and never went back to university. So I've been interested in religion and philosophy. And I think there are some really strong and really interesting links between religion and what we do, uh, which we can go into another time. But anyway, more directly as we want to the, the, I have been blogging for the last two years at an Australian circus magazine called Carnival Cinema, carnivalcinema.com.au. So I've done a monthly blog there for two years. And I, as you can probably hear through this interview, I always have a lot to say. So I don't express myself so well in sound bites. So as I mentioned, I think in the first episode, I kind of go, you have to do six meters of scrolling on your phone to read my blog post. So even (laughs) if you're interested, that makes most people fall off the wagon, even though we're living in a time where people are interested in more long form uh, 
a journalism or a long form taking in more deeper ideas. Uh, that is a lot to ask of people. And so it's actually last year when I was in this uh, incredible Danish circus called Circus Nemo. During that time, I had this idea. I was going, oh, I should make it into a podcast. And then when I talked to people, they found I, I found that their reactions were so sort of lackluster. They're going, oh, yeah, yeah, that that doesn't surprise me. Like, because I've been listening to podcasts since 2005, relig religiously getting into all and, uh, and how I haven't thought that I should do that. And, and add on to that at my wife's uh, lack of uh, ex uh, excitement over the ideas that I've been, when I went away all that, that year when I went away so much, I was recording audiobooks for my daughter. Mm. So I recorded the entire Fantastic Mr. Fox and the entire BFG and some different other Norwegian, but all in Norwegian for my daughter. So I recorded and I was using all the voices for the different ones so that she could listen to my voice when I was away. Um, so I had already had, even had the kind of equipment that I have been recording it with. So it was all very sort of natural, but then like things are, you just don't have the time to make the idea come to life. And then the pandemic came and sort of in the beginning, you're just watching TV in the daytime and getting drunk or whatever. And then after a little bit, you just go, this is, uh, this is not, uh, <laughs> this is not going to finish. So I need to, and then I get, Naki, when I don't perform, I'm, I'm, my name is Frodo and I'm an addict, I'm completely addicted to performing. And when I don't perform, I am not the best, uh, husband or father, I think. So, um, you know, once I've gotten over that, then I, um, have managed to put all of my effort into getting this idea realized and response has been great. I think something you just said, I was going to ask you a different question, but I think something you just said is is like an interesting kind of idea for performers because I know Brett Fister has talked about the idea that it's like addictive performing and, and the, the literal applause. Yeah. And, and receiving the applause from an audience is literally addictive. And when you can't perform during this pandemic and get that like high from being on stage, I mean, I can't, I, it's a, it's an aspect of it that I haven't actually really like contemplated about mm -hmm performers because it's like oh like you can't do your job blah 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 but the actual feeling of being on stage you also don't get yeah that's right so there's a very direct physical like yeah on, on almost like a biological level you're used to a certain kind of interaction with the world uh, and that gives you this great high like it's very few occupations where you only work for a 10 minutes and then afterwards people are like clapping and cheering and so happy that you did your job and going, oh man, you must be tired after that. It's like, yeah, I am, but you know, <laughs> but at the same time, it's this, it's the philosophical thing as well. We are so like, there's this uh, triangle of, of, uh, um, that when you look at what the showman is, you can't understand what the showman is without looking at it, uh, in relation to the show and to the audience. So that when the performer is doing a show, if there is no audience, then that becomes a rehearsal and it isn't the same thing. So it's like each one of those show, crowd, and uh, showman, if you don't have any of those kind of pillars, then the whole thing falls apart. And, it, and what makes the weirdly masturbatory, lonely thing of being alone in a room rehearsing your juggling or whatever it that becomes incredibly meaningful exactly in this interaction mm -hmm. and it takes it from being uh very weird to becoming very meaningful and when you take that away then it's like i have all these skills but now that it all over the world for possibly for the first time ever there is no places to do shows because that's been my reaction previously if there's been uh, been some kind of disaster and lost the contract, you go somewhere else and do something else. But here, that hasn't been the option. So now, for once, it's like there is no use for these skills that I have. And, uh, well, until I just stumbled on this brand new stage, which is totally safe. It's the sound stage that you guys have been playing on for a long time now. Well, I'll, one thing I now have been repeating, you're like the 10th person I've said this to in a day, but another Franco Dracoan reference from a podcast he did, he has a beautiful quote that he's quoting from somebody else 
that radio is the most visual of all mediums, mm -hmm. which of course it is because it's entirely in your imagination, but it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Nine percent invisible did an episode called something cherry ocean, something about some radio commercials from the 50, from the fifties, I think about exactly this thing, the imagery that you can sell on radio is so big and I'm only just getting into it now. And my second season, like I have ideas for where it can go. And also, cause in a way, also the podcast is to throw that in there is that I have been writing both fiction and a lot of nonfiction for the last 15 years or so, but for who knows exactly what I have published very little of it. So I have a very big back catalog of things that are products that are, completely done or almost done or whatever. So that's also what this is. It's like I'm coming out as a writer in a way. Well, one thing you just, you mentioned about philosophy. So awesome to know that. That was my minor in my undergrad. So I'm very yes. simpatico about showbiz. And you said and philosophy. I was like, oh, here, here we go. Philosophy and different things. Here we go. Oh, excellent. But, excellent. Um, this You're isn't really a philosophical, I guess, it, it, I mean, it, it can be at, looked at within a philosophical lens. But do you just, and this isn't even really a circus question, do you feel like this pandemic and, you know, being forced to stop is uh, cosmically on purpose in some way or totally random? Um, I think it's like I, 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 I certain that is a complicated question because I am torn between two different ways of looking at the world. And one of them I'd go, yeah, I mean, the the sort of scientific answer or whatever gone, I think it's random in a, in a sense, because, uh, well, no, I think that did, I don't think anybody made it and I don't think, but cosmically, I think it's also can be important because this, it forces you to see the world in a different way. So I certainly think that, it, that the lessons that can be learned from it and the things that it has done for me, uh, of what's going on in this household now has been almost, it's almost completely positive. The, growth of creativity that comes when you have the force or you have something shut off in one end and you get it come out in another one that is really good and i hope that that transforms to the rest of the world as well because so much of of good work also comes from constraints it's, mm -hmm. if it's all just completely like the idea of a brainstorm where everybody in the company including the driver is is going to throw their ideas out there because we just want to get this like it is so liquid and viscous that it falls out. You need a captain to take charge of it and drive it in some sort of direction. And, and that constraint of it going through one person or, or I'm going to, the show is not going to be larger than one suitcase or whatever constraints you put, that is going to help you focus and it's going to increase creativity as opposed to the other way. So whether the pandemic is happened, uh, for a reason or so it certainly can be an important tool mm -hmm. mm. yes there was a thing that i don't i can't quote it perfectly because i don't remember but it was basically like you know the the this happened so we could learn this this happens so we could learn this this happens so we could learn this and it is all things that have happened in 2020 and if you think about it that way it's like it's it's interesting to think of all of these like barriers that have been put up now as like a learning uh, opportunity and a growth opportunity because I think like when everything shut down originally it was like what the f like are you serious like this sucks like we were on such a trajectory of momentum and then it's like it was like such a downward spiral and then you're like okay I'm here like I'm sitting in this for a while I have to figure out a way out of it and like those like lows are always so beneficial because it's like what? yeah yeah well just uh, uh, you say oh. that i mean did i cut you off your, your thought no, <laughs> well yeah no it's fine no finish it no no i don't even remember i was just gonna say it there's a going back to these kinds of marriage like old sayings and philosophy and things <laughs> to your point i i read this somebody on facebook posted this right in the beginning of the pandemic but it's like um some kind of old saying phrase which is you know this man uh has a farm and one day his horse goes missing it just goes off into the distance and the neighbor says oh my god this is so terrible i'm so sorry this happened to you you lost your horse 
And the guy's like, well, you don't know what's good or bad. And the next day, the horse comes back with 12 feral horses. And the neighbor's like, oh, my God, what a blessing. Look at all these horses you have now. This is great. And the guy's like, I don't know what's good or bad. And uh, the next day, his son is trying to tame one of these feral horses. And the horse knocks him off and he breaks his leg. And his neighbor's like, oh, my God, what a curse. Your son, he broke his leg. Like, what's going to happen? The guy's like, I don't know what's good or bad. And the next day... The, the army comes into town and they're prescribing soldiers and the son isn't eligible for it because he's broken his leg. And it was like, oh, it's so good or bad. And the whole thing goes on forever, yeah. essentially. But it's this attitude of viewing the world and events as good or bad to you is not the most useful frame to think of anything uh, no. in. I think Brett Alters actually posted that. I on think that's Facebook? where we saw that. Yeah, maybe that's where we saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I spend a lot of time talking... Uh talking this kind of talk with uh, Brett Alters, we're in the same show. <laughs> yep. and, uh, oh, yeah, of course, in opium. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I have uh, this dichotomy in my life where I am interested in uh, the, uh, sort of Western esotericism and the occult and uh, psychedelics and these things. And so is Brett Alters. And then we have Brett Loudermilk sitting in between us. <laughs> so when we talk one way and then he just like, he, I, he just rolls his eyes at the, when we're talking about some of these things, because that's the other, the, the other, because you asked the question before, it's like, is there, is there a reason for it? Because if you look at it from a more kind of occult point of view and you just entertain this idea, then I do think that there's like a guy that I, I, I wrote about uh, a book called the lost knowledge of, uh, of uh, the imagination in my podcast that came out today, that guy, Gary Lackman, he's written another book, not on imagination, but that's called the caretakers of the cosmos. And it raises this idea that there's that man, mankind has arrived on earth and we're the only species that comes completely unprescribed. There, there's no, our arms aren't shovels like the mold. Mold has shovel arms. So it's clear what the bat has its fingers are for flying. So as, as we come out and we're unfinished and, and kind of he's making the he's using the kind of different like Kabbalah and the different traditions of uh, of uh, the kind of occult knowledge or whatever to make a case for the fact that we that we are the caretakers of the cosmos and we're in a way coming uh, becoming aware of that concept right now like you, we've just only discovered in the 70s or whatever like environmentalism and understanding that we've we've delved deeply into um reductionist science and the deeper you look the more you will find but the systems thinking and ecology is becoming bigger and bigger and the problems that are are facing us at the moment are global it's a migration on a global scale it's a, it's a, it's global warming it's it's problems that can't be solved by going smaller and smaller it's, it, we need to go step out on a bigger scale so if you think of it like that that that, that there is could potentially be a role assigned for uh, mankind then you can also possibly entertain that as we are coming awake in the universe and becoming aware of our role in the cosmos that also the cosmos are throwing things at us in a way and that that, that there is a kind of symbiosis that that smells of of uh, Lovelock's Gaia theory or uh, Gaia hypothesis, you know. And so I certainly like that idea and I like that image. And I find always I'm just stuck between these these two different things because I can argue one of them. And in a way, this caretakers of the cosmos, lost knowledge of the imagination, and this deeper kind of knowledge is a is is a, is a beautiful thing and it's a powerful thing to draw on from for a showman uh, and and I have sort of in a way created that that's what the world of the carnival is for me in my what it's like thinking of as the, the carnival of dreams this thing that never existed but when you but it is it's like the the, uh, the where as you walk through the gate of this thing it's the carnival of life and you walk in and every aspect of what you see inside that carnival you see there because it is the things that interests humanity we see danger we see sexy things we see unbelievable things we meet the occult we get challenged by the uh, physically by the rides and everything and as you go in here inside the parameter fences of that carnival you can just 
let yourself go a little. And for me, who has been so deeply entrenched in science, I'm coming out of it by allowing myself to experience that inside this space. And it's mm -hmm. similar to what Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, called he calls his rituals, because he's an atheist who's founded a religion, he says his rituals is to be understood as a as an intellectual decompression chamber, the place where you go in to access another type of understanding the world, another way that is still richly emotional and connects you to the world. And I make that case in today in the, in my well in the in the current second episode of my podcast that there are these different kinds of imagination, and and we experienced up until the scientific method came and. Uh, grew big in the 1700s, we experienced the world not through that. We had a much more imaginative and direct kind of, and particularly if you go even further back to when we were living in the caves, we participated in the world in a different way. So, I mean, this is a very, was a very big end scope, but that this is the other angle. That's why I was hesitating so much as to how to, to answer that question. Because up until this podcast, I have never spoken like this publicly. One thing you said that also, like, with the idea of this, like, imagination that I feel like also adds kind of the wonder of circus to the wonder of circus and, like, carnival is the idea of impermanency in both and, like, the constant and in life, and in life right? Mm. Like, it's constantly moving and disappearing and coming and going. And, like, you know, I've, like, in the... 1800s the idea that you know one day the circus just pops up and then it's gone the next and that like magical feeling of this group of people coming and leaving without even a trace of their existence is also kind of I think what makes this genre of art also an interesting kind of part of the imagination in a way that theater doesn't feel because it's like very permanently in these theater structures you know and yeah. you know where you can go to find theater and you don't always know where you can go to find carnivals or circus or sideshows, you know? It's a, it's a very, I find it for myself. And it's like, I, in, in the stuff that I talk about in the way of the showman, it's called the way of the showman, of course, because it, 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 that rings of some secret knowledge already. And I, I've mentioned some other place that I'm in, like interested in or inspired by secret societies because they they see also like like the showman they, you don't know where they are and, mm -hmm. and then you appear and they're doing some secret uh, sign, but you know so like a direct link is 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 Freemasonry which has taken a tool the tool of bricklaying and building houses and turned it into a, a symbolic a very detailed and richly rewarding way to look at the world through the uh, compass and the right angle and the, the plum, these very simple tools and you're using them. And I am in the metaphor of circus seeing at least as rich a world uh, as what you can find in masonry. Mm -hmm. So speculative masonry or Freemasonry or otherwise, we're like, it is, it is so, it has so much potential to be used as this. And this is what I'm, I'm drawing on as my, inspiration for what I'm talking about. So you, you're totally right. It's so fertile. Well, you're, Lindsay was almost hitting at one of the reasons why we called our little production company Hideaway Circus, because that's what the word hideaway is getting at. It's the, yeah. it's the disappearing hidden thing you have to, you have to find. Um, <laughs> you can grab onto it anywhere. Just like you say, just the fact that the, the carnival, it packs up mm -hmm. and it's all on the truck. And if there is a, breakdown or there is like a flooding so you can't get to the next town you have this thing on the back of your truck with this incredible potential for growth and human experience and connections and the things that happen at the carnival so how many people had their first kiss at the carnival this is the first where transgressions are flaunted and celebrated and, and the, the things that happen it's it's like the mexican day of the dead it's this one day when the circus comes to town in the not so long at the time that you talk about in 1800 circus day was a thing and mm -hmm. you were legally getting the day off because the circus arrived in town and then they'd arrive in the morning kind of out of nowhere and pop up the thing and then maybe do two shows of 10,000 people in the city of 4,000 
people who come from everywhere, see the shows, then pack down and do the same overnight. It's it's incredible. Yeah. And it has this dreamlike thing. Mm -hmm. Next day, it's just a flat ground. And if you were there at the carnival the day before and the things you did and the things you said, I, under the influence or otherwise, it, it might be highly inappropriate at any other time, but you put up that uh, perimeter fence and inside there, the the different rules apply, you know. It's and whether the and in that space as well, it's like everybody goes. It's like an, an imaginal space, like what uh, Messia Eliade calls the sacred space. It's it's a different, and that is it's a different rules apply, and time uh, is experienced differently, and space is is experienced differently, and um, and truth is also our relationship to truth within this context is also different because. Whether the woman with the beard, whether whether that is real or not, it's almost beside the point. In a kind of flavor of professional wrestling, if you're mm -hmm. saying, "Yeah, but it's not real," it's like, "Yeah, but do you sit and say this when you're watching Star Wars as well?" Like, right. what? You, it's, I know what this is, but it is more amazing than what it would be if they were just fighting. Because UFC is an ugly spectacle, and there's something so theatrical and 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 exaggerated in professional wrestling, you know, it's a, anyway, that's a digression, but yeah. It's, yes. Um, yes. I mean, I could, I could defend UFC for sure. Cause I do like fight watching <laughs> it. I like the realness I of do. UFC, but I with you on the, I do on the fiction of, of like WWE, but they get injured. Yeah, um, oh, of course they get injured. Yeah. yeah. I mean, badly. I'm not, uh, I'm not speaking on either of them. And one is as ridiculous as the other <laughs> one, is real. but it's, uh, more on the nature of truth because the other yeah. one is truth and there's no discussion about it but if you tell the fan of the other one that it isn't real then they go what do you what what's your point yeah, yeah exactly so yeah I'm uh, gonna, i just have to pee again i'm sorry yeah uh, good, well, good. it's Get it out. You talk can, oh sorry so, oh. um you know, it's funny that's the reason why we started the podcast in the first place was because Lindsay and i felt like there was this knowledge that existed that was never really written down or if it's written down it's in books that aren't published anymore um and how do, how do how do how do we or but anybody who's listening um turn that ethereal thing the thing we want to make that garden that carnival that circus that has these constraints and allows for these magical things in such a real practical existing world and who are the people mm -hmm. who've cracked it and how and why um, and I mean, there's a lot of having done now, like 85 of these episodes, a lot of through lines, um, but they're all very, very, uh, different. And the balance between escapism and realism as well in all of these stories is so, uh, fascinating talking about things like bleeding over into one another. Like if you're doing this to escape something or if you're doing it, you know, uh yeah the why the why behind why people do these things and create these yeah. spaces is very interesting and why it's worth it to have a truck i mean all the metaphors of the truck breaking down in the mud and then you know that is both real and metaphorical in its yeah. truth it's a really interesting this that what you just say there that i love that about how did you arrive at the circus where you're running away from something and then this was there or did you run towards this thing it's a uh, there's so many different stories just within that. It's like, how did you find your way here? Were you running away or were you seeking this out? Or that's, that's an interesting, uh, yeah, and it attracts a very special kind of person. But you know, what I find is really interesting and what I think makes some of these, these podcasts more elevated than others of our, you know, some episodes more elevated than others is circus by nature. I'll put it away, theater by nature draws intellectual people to it. You know, they want to talk about, this play and what happened in the play and the performances. And, you know, uh, if you've seen the play doubt, for example, the whole point of that play is to make you consider, did this person molest somebody else? And you will never know, but the whole point is to challenge your brain while with circus, it often, but not always, it brings people who are more athletically focused and less intellectually focused into the room. And I think, I think mm. podcasts are the rare space to have that intellectual discussion or even academic. But I think also on the same frame, what I really like about your podcast and a handful of other people when we talk about academic 
is it's not academic in the sense of it trying to be highbrow academic, which to me is very off-putting. It was actually a question I was going to ask earlier. I'll ask it now. Was there ever moments where you felt frustrated by being categorized as a lowbrow art as opposed to a, a highbrow art? Or was it always the fact that it was lowbrow and mass appeal as opposed to opera or ballet or something, what was inherently appealing? Yeah, I I have certainly fallen into this role of doing entertainment, which is often thought of as lowbrow. But being a popular entertainment, popular just means that it is for the people. And I'm really interested in the showman. I think of the showman as, as someone who faces the others. That is the role that we play. And you have walked with the crowd, but then at some point you've turned around to face the others. And as you do, when you call for attention, you have to have something to show them. You have to have be able to do something or else they will eventually just get annoyed with you and either they'll, they'll lynch you and get rid of you because you're annoying or they will completely ignore you. So that I find that kind of... Um, well, now I now I just dug myself in a hole. Like I lost the, what was the train of no, thought? No, the question was the the. Have you ever felt, particularly since you're somebody who likes the intellectual, more yes. academic conversation, pigeonholed by being described as lowbrow? That's right. So all the, the what I just said still stands, but it's like this is my interest: the interaction with the people, and starting out first doing shows with my dad, and then being on the street. I felt that democratizing effect of being on the street where you can catch literally anyone who is walking by to some extent you you can catch them and capture them in grab them get them into the show and give them an incredible experience i i do like that aspect of it so i am i i also think that you know in a sense circus has also like it has and these things have become lowbrow uh but I, I have a fascination in my life with everything that is uh, looking towards the stars when it is lying in the gutter, like Oscar Wilde said. So I, my first true love of poetry came through reading the poetry of Charles Bukowski. And he writes about uh, gambling and drinking in dive bars and about, uh, about whores and fights and this real is but from these essentially kind of ugly realities he conjures these incredibly um beautiful and tender moments and i love and and i love the music of tom waits who has a strong theatrical uh feeling in his music and also sings of these things is his music you know once he'd met Kathleen Brennan and he gets this his wife and they create this demented dwarf orchestra sound that comes straight out of my imagination and it's like it, it conjures up something completely different and this is also something that feels like low bright but it is it's guiding you towards something much greater and I read Donald Duck comics is a huge thing in in um, in Scandinavia, and there's one, there's two of the drawers who make those stories: Carl Barks and Don Rosa, two giants within this. Who both you're reading stories about these ducks that you think is a lowbrow kind of thing, but there is an epicness to what's going on in here, which points to a lot more important things than whether they come to a lost place in the Andes and find some square eggs. And I love all of these. This is just what comes off the top of my head of things where I like, which is it is lowbrow, but it tells much greater truths. And I think the potential of when somebody comes to see a circus or they come to see a showman, and I'm performing around them, easy to look at it if you just think I'm on the street and you don't expect anything all of a sudden you find this and then you're transported into another world you have an experience that you couldn't possibly imagine that that, that you didn't expect and thereby you have the chance of elevating them all that much more than if you're already uh, an arts critic and you come in and you're judging the piece on everything else it's not mm. as the, the experience is not as direct so mixing together the uh, the academic or the thoughts, if I can bring ideas into the people and using the emotions to connect to them and my actions is what makes this possible and their actions, are, this is 
to me the quintessential human experience, possibly more so than um, fine art. Well, I think you've just clarified a series of thoughts I've had for a very long time about it in a, in a nice way. So I think maybe we, we wrap the, the regular part there and we, we, now that we're approaching the hour and a half mark, get you the three questions we get all of our guests to answer. Uh, the first well, one, one thing before we go into the questions, the, the one thing I do think about low brow art is because people are not, um, they don't feel excluded by it. It allows for a lot more people to come to it and like experience it versus highbrow, which feels elitist in some way. Like, Oh, I don't know if I belong there. And, um, mm. and that's something that I think is just is so special about kind of it the is. genre of art. When you're watching, if you're going to an art exhibition and you're watching a performance art or you're watching, watching a painting, I think, you come into that place if you're if you're one of the uninitiated. You come in and then you look at the picture and you don't know whether you can say that you like it or not in a way because you feel like you might be wrong mm -hmm. because someone will be able to tell you why this is good or why this is not because there's all sorts of reasons why this is what and it doesn't have that same kind of immediate uh, immediacy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think yeah, there's something. Oh, I'm, I'm, synthesizing all of these ideas as well because I'm at, at, at the, I'm some of these things I've thought about a lot just recently I'm writing a book called The Way of the Shonen which is my occult or hidden philosophy of uh, showmanship so I'm I'm connecting all of these dots uh, back together again and there's kind of a whole awesome we can add it to our bookshelf save us a signed copy for sure <laughs> yeah Okay. Anyway, anyway, but well, the, we can that'll, that'll actually be the second question. So we'll skip. We'll go. We'll we'll come back to the the recommendations. But uh, has there been a piece of advice, either really good or really terrible, that somebody has given you and has stuck with you? One of the things that I keep coming back to in my own work is uh, comes from my dad. He had uh, we were early adopters of computers, and he had a dot matrix printer print out of an A4 piece of paper that hung above where he, he makes and produces magic tricks. That's what he does now. He doesn't really perform anymore. He produces and sells magical effects and things. And he has this sign there, and it just says, in Norwegian, it says, it's like, try simpler. Try something more simple. Make it more simple. And I use that so much in the way that, especially when I'm performing on stage, I have a tendency to, as you can tell, to think too much. And then when I present something for the first time, it's just too complicated. And usually it's like, you gotta, you gotta strip it back. You write it and it gets overwritten and you gotta strip it back. So that's, that's, um, that's advice that I keep coming back to. Oh, yeah, I love that. I could for sure use, <laughs> I'm going to write that on Josh's that. desk. <laughs> um, yeah, yes. etch it, etch it in. Um, <laughs> so, uh, for somebody who is a student or maybe a student of any age, but somebody who's trying to learn, is there a book or a movie, TV show, live show? Not that people can go to live shows, but is there a reference that you, you would share with somebody you think is great or special? I truly love the TV show, HBO TV show called Carnivale. Oh. I, that is an extraordinarily rich mind for me. It's a... It has, an, has a deep occult flavor to it. it. The two protagonists is a preacher, and the character of the preacher, it is this whole section of what I haven't talked about in what I'm interested in, but that is, I find that just unbelievably fascinating, the preacher or the shaman. And he is this, and then you have this guy that starts traveling, a young guy who might have some strange abilities, who starts kind of randomly gets picked up by a carnival and the, the way that this comes together and the way that it ties together heaven and hell and uh, everything in between is very, very good. Uh, and uh, what's the, uh, what kind of books? Uh, is there a poet, I, you, poet you would recommend? David White. I really liked David White. And there is another example of an artist, which I find an extraordinary artist is a, uh, 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 um, Irish of Irish descent, Irish British, and uh, he lives in America now. And he wrote a book um, 
he's he has become like a kind of corporate um the he wrote a book about the soul of corporate america so he uses poetry and he talks about um in a way for them to refine their soul uh, and straight away when somebody's writing i find that so so difficult or like going what this is so weird but then you go this is the exact i'm realizing that that's another reason why i like it so much i mean he just writes normal kind of poetry but he does a lot of talking and motivational talking in the arena of business so he's become this weird sort of a uh, hybrid where where his books are about work but it's from the point of view of a of a poet so what does work actually look like when you really look at it in depth from a poetic angle and and i got this is exactly what i do with what we do you take something that is essentially i mean my whole enterprise is about the fact that people ask you all the time you know, what do you what's your real job <laughs> what is it because it's just something inherent in what we do that it's not serious and you can't have a meaningful life and do this there's got to be something more to it and I, but I have found that meaning, and and uh, he has found that meaning in uh, in that. He's just recently he did a podcast, uh, or not just did something with Sam Harris uh, recently, which might be available for people to listen to. I was trying to wear on, if you on Sam it, Harris's I, show. Yeah, on yeah. Uh, his make uh, making sense. I'm also follow his uh, his uh, waking up app actually, which is a meditation app, and then through. While I am already a fan, then all of a sudden one of the streams of meditations you can do gets run by this guy, David White. So he reads a poem and talks about his poetry. He also, David White has done some great uh, TED Talks. So Google David White and TED and uh, you'll find some of his stuff and might see he, one of his poems, um, Finisterre and, and another one called Santiago. He talks about the way. So I only saw this letter. So as soon as they talk about the way or a way to walk, then uh, I'm like, oh, wow, you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, our, now we're going to, I'm going to see all these new books on our bookshelf that Josh is going to go buy now. <laughs> Poetry and philosophy. <laughs> and I just reorganized our bookshelf. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, but our last question is, who do you think we should have on the podcast? <sighs> Who should have on the podcast? Ah, oh, that's a really interesting question. Ah, oh, I'm so that we know here. I think you should have Jay Gilligan on the podcast. Jay Gilligan's the next episode. He's coming on Thursday. <laughs> Is he? Yeah. Oh, well. Wow. It's, it's an interesting episode. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I've been uh, having encounters with him over the last few years, and I, he is not only is he an unbelievably technically skilled uh, juggler, but he is, he is a real artist, mm -hmm. like a, a true artist in the sense of he's put, I don't know if he's, have you seen this YouTube channel where he's put up all of his work? That is such a formidable and intimida intimidating channel to watch. <laughs> this guy has made so much work and explored the, limits of juggling so much we when he lived he was an absinthe uh, here in las vegas for a while and we were having these uh we'd steal away from our families and drive away somewhere go to a chinese donut store or out to some the blue diamond into a beautiful place and then talk for hours talk in the car talk there and then talk back about all these things that what we've just talked about now oh you're gonna love the jay episode and i assume he'll love this episode but um uh, I can make I can make that request happen for you, Frodo. <laughs> Which granted. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Uh, the Thanks time so really flew me. by. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor to be here, and I've uh, been a long term listener, so it's uh, nice to be invited on. <laughs> And that was our interview with Captain Frodo. If you like our podcast, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, tweet us, or email us at hello at hideawaycircus.com. Have a good week. Our podcast is also available on Circus Talk, the international circus community's online resource and employment tool. If you are not a member yet, register and find your spotlight with Circus Talk today.